Hello, everyone. We are doing another uh, recording of the occupational therapist, Jean Vierre Hoist Forrester. Based off of the survey feedback we received, people wanted to see her presentation in full, which includes how to get up safely from a fall and how to fall safely. So, Jean Vierre Hoist Forrester, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Megan Claire. Um, so for those who may not know, my name is Jean-Vierre Hoist Forrester. I am currently a doctoral student at the New York Institute of Technology, and I'm pursuing a degree in occupational therapy. Um, throughout my schooling experience, we have various clinical settings that we go into um, and practice. And while practicing, um, I've come into contact with a lot of patients who need help in terms of fall prevention, getting up from a fall. So I've kind of collected all that information that I've given to patients, to caregivers, to family members, and provided it here for you today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, there we go. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about a fall action plan. Um, and this plan can be used by clients, patients, caregivers, family members, um, anyone who has cancer and is at risk for falling, especially due to cancer treatment, right? So this is how to fall safely after cancer diagnosis, during treatment, and in survivorship. So I want to preface this by saying that it is a safe space. So it's no secret that falling can make you feel clumsy, especially when it is frequent. It kind of makes you feel like you have less control over your body, right? And that, that feeling is natural. Um, the frustration and the fear that comes with that is very natural and is very valid. So along your journey, you will probably fall. <laughs> More than likely, you will. And that's okay, right? As long as we're equipped with the information to prevent ourselves from falling so it doesn't happen often, and to get up safely, and to fall safely, right? And remember that you're not alone in this journey. So you're continuing to heal. And healthcare professionals, the cancer community, your family, we're here to support you. So first I wanna speak about side effects and sensitivities because those are the main reasons why falling may occur, right? So the medications, the therapies like chemotherapy, radiation, hormone therapy used to treat breast cancer can have side effects that result in losing sensation in your feet and making it difficult to walk, um, making you dizzy, making you confused, uh, creating brain fog, right? So these side effects and our sensitivity levels to them increase our risk of falling. So for example, blood thinners, which is a medication that prevents our blood from clotting, um, can affect our ability to heal properly and may cause us to bruise exponentially when we fall, right? So it increases our risk of bleeding out if we do get a cut when we fall. So say we hit our head and there's a cut on the side of our head, we may not be able to stop the bleeding as quickly because our body is affected by those medications that we take. Um, so we need to be mindful of that and careful of that. And CIPN, right? So Cher did a webinar on CIPN. And if you would like to learn more about that um, in depth, you can definitely check it out on their website. Um, but that's damage to the peripheral nerves, which alters our sensation. So when I was talking about the feet before, lack of sensation in our feet can make it difficult to walk, right? Because we, we may not be able to feel the ground or we may not feel as steady, right? And that instability could possibly lead us to fall, especially when we're walking on uneven surfaces. So how are we gonna protect ourselves when we're falling? The number one step that I like to stress um, exponentially, like it's very important is to protect your head, right? Because everything that is vital to us is up there. I like to call it prime real estate. So when we're falling, our number one thing is we need to protect our head. We need to protect that prime real estate. So the medications that I was talking about before, and as I said before, it can increase our risk of bleeding. So if we do develop head trauma, or if we have a cut on our head, we, not, might, be, we might not be able to stop it um, as readily as we would if we weren't on those medications, such as chemotherapy or the anticoagulants, right? So we're at greater risk for bleeding and bruising. And that doesn't just mean external bleeding, so bleeding that we can see. We could also be at risk for internal bleeding as well. 
And another consideration is hair, right? So no matter what stage we are in the process, if we're in the preparation stage where we may be removing our hair, if we're in treatment and we're experiencing hair loss, um, if we're in survivorship and our hair is just starting to grow back, uh, that's a barrier that some people may not think about consciously, right? So that lack of protection that we may be used to having is gone and we need to accommodate for that. So that accommodation looks like using your arms and your hands as a shield, right? So if we protect ourselves using ourselves, um, we can reduce the incidence of head trauma, bleeding, cuts. And that's as simple as it sounds, as I said before, you're just shielding your head. So I'm actually gonna do it and I hope that we can do it together um, at home, <laughs> you're following along. So the first step into protecting your head effectively is to lower your head by tucking your chin down into your chest. Yes, perfect, Mike and Claire. <laughs> Place both hands at the side of your head with your elbow directly in front of you, right? So it's kind of like we're on our ears. Yeah, perfect, just like that. And when we're falling, right? So this is the basis. We're protecting our head. When we're falling, we're gonna turn our head and our arms to the side, just like that. Yep, so when you're falling, you wanna make sure that you're landing on this cushioned area of your arm Perfect, yes. So that it can bear all of the impact or most of the impact, right? So that reduces the risk of head traumas and broken bones. Um, the cushion parts, the best parts. And if you find yourself falling backwards, that's just a simple adjustment of the arms and hands, right? So we're gonna go further back to protect the back of our head, right? Because we don't want our head to hit the ground because that's a lot of a lot of damage that can occur. So we're gonna protect our head by placing our hands right at the back or the base of the skull. And it's our hands are gonna take the brunt of the impact, right? And if you can, still try to go for the side, but if you have to fall on your back, that is fine as long as you're protecting your head. And if you are on those medications that I mentioned before, make sure that you contact your provider because they may wanna know about that fall. They definitely should know about that fall, right? Because they may wanna check up on you, make sure you have no internal bleeding, no head trauma, um, nothing that can really cause later side effects. Okay, so we're, we've protected our head already, right? So now we're gonna try for the side. And like I said, when you're protecting your head, you automatically wanna turn to the side. So it's natural for us to try to catch ourselves when we're falling. I know that I do it too. Uh, we kind of put our hands out and we're like, oh, hold on, I got it. It might not be as bad if I try to catch myself but we can actually make it worse if we do. Um, so in order to reduce that, we wanna try for the side. When we put our arms and our hands out, we're at greater risk for broken bones, specifically to our hands, our wrists, we may dislocate our shoulder, and we call those foosh injuries. So foosh is falling on outstretched hands, right? So if you put your hand up and you feel the base of your palm, right above your wrist, you can feel how bony it is, right? It's not a lot of cushion there, um, not a lot of tissue. So when you hit the ground, that impact is going to go directly onto hard surfaces, which are the bones, which will lead us to breakage, right? And we wanna avoid that as much as possible. So we wanna protect our head and go for the side. We wanna go for the cushion part of our arms where there's more tissue for the impact to go through. So the best way to prevent or reduce injuries is to get into a fetal-like position when we're falling. So protecting our head and kind of how babies are in the womb, right? We're gonna curl in, bring our knees up, and we're gonna go for the side. So this technique works in most situations. Um, I know that a lot of clients um, have concerns about hip fragility, right? So if I fall on the side, I may be more likely to uh, break my hip or, I have a hip replacement and I'm worried or concerned about having that type of impact on the device that's in my hip, right? So we could use different techniques. Um, a lot of times when that concern is brought up, I like to say, go for the butt, right? So let, let's try to fall backwards so that we fall on that cushion area instead of our arms. But you can always speak to your therapist or whoever is providing your fall prevention techniques. Um, to see what works best for you, right? Because a lot of times we have to tailor it specifically to clients, um, but this is just a general uh, way of falling safely. Okay, so we've 
protected our head and we've tried for the side. The next important step is to be loose. So the fear and the shock of falling can cause you to tense up. And that is natural, right? Because we're like, oh my gosh, it's going to be painful when I hit the ground. Um, I want to protect myself. But we have to remember that tensing up increases our likelihood of becoming injured, right? So broken bones, sprains. We want to make sure that we're breathing and we're going with the motion, right? Because the more you relax, so if you sit back and take a deep breath and let it out, you can kind of feel the tension moving from your body, right? It's the same way with a fall. So if you stay loose and you allow your body to relax, your body will be able to absorb the shock better. And when you're not tense, you're less likely to become injured. So I like to say, be loose as a goose. And this is my little goose, um, reminding you to be, you know, kind of loose, kind of flexible. Um, so we've protected our head, we've tried for the side, we're breathing and we're making sure that we're loose. And next, we're going to make sure we roll and don't bounce. So roll it out. Now, that's a silly thing to say. And I don't mean roll continuously, like down a hill, um, like the games many of us probably play as children. Um, but this technique, we maybe do it like once or twice, right, to prolong our fall. And that prolonging can help our body absorb the impact better, right? So it's spreading it out over the body instead of coming to an abrupt stop. So say we fall on our right side, right? Instead of just hitting the ground and that being the only point of impact, I hit the ground, I roll on my back and roll toward the other side. I'm spreading that force out, right? So I'm less likely to have major injuries on this side because the force is going over a greater area. Um, and that's a technique that can be used when there's a clear path right? So if we're on soft surfaces like the grass and there's a clear path ahead of you, roll it out. If you're at home and you're on the carpet, roll it out. Um, just don't <laughs> roll into anything. That's like a tip I like to say, um, because that just puts you at greater risk for other injuries. So we have protect the head, try for the side, be loose as a goose, and roll it out. That is a lot to remember. And I am very aware of that. So I like to say, let's be real and remember the most important part, right? And that will be protect the head and meet with meat. So if all else fails, remember to meet with the most cushioned parts of your body, right? So whether that's the butt, if that's the arms, the side of your arms, if that's your thighs, wherever you have the most meat on your body will most likely be the safest place for you to fall with minimal injuries. Right. And that's as a last resort. Right. You have to practice the other steps and techniques um, to learn how to fall safely so it can become second nature. But if you don't remember anything, remember, protect the head and meet with me. So you've fallen. What do you do now? First, we're going to check for injuries. Right. So if we do a quick body scan, whether that's looking, visually looking, or if that's just feeling, if we move a little and we feel that we're hurting, we're going to stay there, right? We're going to contact emergency services, contact our um, caregivers or our support system, whoever we need to contact so that we can get services to us quickly. If we feel like we can get up, we're going to get up, right? Um, and I have steps on how to get up safely as well. But I always say, whether you are there and you can't get up or you can get up, you need to notify someone and you know just let them know like, hey, I've fallen, I need help, or hey, I've fallen, just letting you know so that you can check on it, in on me later. And that brings me to my next point of programming emergency numbers into your phone. It's very important, right? Cause that could be a few, that could save you a few seconds, right? Of people getting to you faster and you reducing the likelihood of passing out or further injuries, right? So whether that's um, programming 911 into your phone or programming your caregiver into your phone if they're not home, just pressing that one button can be the difference between you staying on the floor a little too long. Um, so I would always say make a spare key, right? So that they can get to you in time because um, that also reduces the time that you're laying on the floor. Um, and there's a variety of spare key hiders. So don't just leave the key in the mailbox. Uh, get something to protect it, right? So that no one can just enter your home. So you can get like a rock, a lockbox, and let that person know where the spare key is, right? So an action plan on how to get into my home or what to do if I fall, right? And you can also let emergency services know, like, hey, 
I've fallen, uh, I can't get up right now, I need your help. There's a spare key here so that you can easily access my house and get to me. It just makes it a lot smoother, right? So how are we gonna get up? So we've fallen safely, we've contacted whoever we need to contact, whether that's emergency services or a caregiver. Um, but if we've contacted our caregiver and we think that we can get up, right? We don't detect any injuries, this is how we're going to do so. So first, um, you should already be on your side if you follow the action plan, right? But if you forgot to follow the action plan, all the steps were gone and you met with me, that is perfect. Um, we're just going to get onto our side and we're gonna make sure that we're getting on the strongest side, right? Or the side that may not be affected by the side effects of cancer treatment. So the side that may not have lymphedema, um, the side where we may have more feeling, right? So you can slowly roll onto whichever your side whichever side of the body you feel is stronger, right? And if you have CIPN or if you have lymphedema on both sides, right? You wanna roll on the side of your dominant hand because you're more likely to be stronger with that arm or that hand. So you're gonna push yourself up using your arm to a side sitting position, kind of like the girl in the corner. <laughs> um, you're gonna crawl and scoot to a solid piece of furniture or a structure that can support your body weight, such as a couch or an outside railing. And I wanna make it clear that in between step two and step three, you can take a break, right? So you wanna make sure that you're not dizzy. You wanna make sure that you have stability, right? Because if we move too fast, we can actually pass out um, because of the difference in our pressure. So we wanna make sure that we're taking a break and we're doing things slowly. So we're pushing ourselves up to our arm in a sitting position. We're gonna crawl or scoot to a solid piece of furniture, right? And make sure that it can support your body weight because if it doesn't, you are more likely to get injured from falling through that piece of furniture, right? Or falling back down. So using that solid furniture structure, bring yourself to a kneeling position with your stronger leg closer to the furniture, right? So if the stronger leg is your right leg or the stronger leg is your left leg, bring that leg closer to the furniture. Slowly slide the foot of the stronger leg towards towards the towards a forward, sorry, so that it is flat on the floor, right? So you want that stronger leg to be flat on the floor because that's the leg that you're gonna push the body weight through, right? You're gonna push it through your hands and also through that leg. So put your hands on the piece of furniture or the structure and push both of your hands down, right? And the stronger foot to slowly raise your body off the ground. And then next you're gonna sit down and that on that piece of furniture or the nearest piece of furniture if you weren't by furniture. And make sure that you're not dizzy. Make sure that you're not experiencing pain. Recheck for injuries, right? That you may not have seen or felt before. And I know that's a lot. It's like, well, I can't visualize that, right? So I've added some visual guides um, here and it will take you through step-by-step. Step, like if you can get up, if you can't get up, um, if you're a caregiver and you witness a fall, what do you do? You can find that in both of these documents, right? And these are from government websites so that you know it's you know legit, this is what I should do, this is what I can do to protect myself. And it has visual instructions so that the things that I've said, you can visually see, right? Someone sliding their foot forward, someone putting their hands on the couch. Um, it just makes it easier, right? Because me saying it may not resonate as well as you seeing it. And I've also provided visual steps on how to fall safely, right? So there's a lot of resources on this information. Um, the latter is definitely provided by government sites, um, but this one, it's kind of difficult to pick which ones are reliable resources, but always go for verified or trained professionals, right? Or organizations. So if it's an occupational therapist or a physical therapist, right? Or a healthcare provider explaining how to fall safely, those are reliable resources. If it's organizations such as AARP or the New York Gov, right? And they're providing ways on how to fall safely. Those are reliable resources. And if you don't like the resources that I provided, you can definitely check out Others, you just type in step-by-step step of how to fall safely. So what are the takeaways from this presentation? First and foremost, protect your head. That is prime real estate. 
meet with meat, right? So if all else fails and we don't remember anything else, meet with the cushion parts of our body. Expect bruising, especially what we talked about earlier, the side effects and sensitivities. If we are on medications that thin our blood, bruising is going to be natural. If we're concerned about the amount of bruising, right? Or we're not comfortable with the fact that there are bruises, we can always speak to our provider and maybe they have some options for us, but it is natural. And so we should expect it and not be surprised if it does happen. Have an emergency contact plan and make sure that the people who are a part of that contact plan know that they're a part of the contact plan, go through it with them, right? So that they know where the keys are, um, so that they know when you call what to do, who they should call, um, how they should get to you. And lastly, practice makes perfect. So when I say practice, I don't mean go out and just fall. Um, I mean, practice the steps, right? Whether you're sitting down, relaxing on the couch, maybe just going through the motion, right? This is how I would fall, right? Uh, meet with me, thinking about it. When we think about things and we practice them more, right? Even if it's just sitting on the couch, we tend to remember it better, right? So in those instances where we do fall, it becomes second age and it's like, oh, let me protect my head, right? Um, so always practice. And if you have someone with you who can help you, you know, get up from a fall, I say practice that as well, right? And those are tips and techniques on how to get up safely from a fall. Stop Thank you so much, jean -Vierre. Um, Really great information and really appreciate um, all of those tips and acknowledging, you know, some of the physical limitations that cancer patients um, can potentially have, like lymphedema or chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. Uh, so let's get into just a, a few more questions that... Um, people asked in our survey, um, can you explain the difference between physical therapy, because Aiden was a physical therapist versus occupational therapy? Because I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of occupational therapy or OT initially. So what is that difference? Yes. So I love to explain it as physical therapy gets you from point A to point B, right? So they're working on mobility they're working on ambulation, which is walking. They're working on flexibility, core strength, um, just basically movement, right? Getting you to move. Whereas occupational therapists help you do the things you want to do, need to do, and you know, basically have to do to live um, from point A to point B. So whether that's activities of daily living, uh, which we call grooming, bathing, um, dressing, right, which can be difficult, especially if we're having side effects such as lymphedema, we may not be able to button our shirt as easily as we used to, right, or lift our arms as high as we used to to get that shirt on. Um, so we help with things such as that, right? So engaging in those occupations, and occupations just means anything that you do throughout life, right? So as much as brushing your teeth is an occupation, driving is an occupation. Um, occupational therapists can help with that too. There's certified um, driving specialists who help people who have in, any impairments get back into driving. Um, we can do IADLs, which we call instrumental activities of daily living. So that can be going to the bank, right? If we're having brain fog, right, or confusion, and we may not be able to handle the things that we used to handle with ease anymore, occupational therapists can give us tips and techniques and set up ways that makes it easier, easier for you to do those things, right? So like maybe setting up automatic checking, but you don't know how to do it. The occupational ther therapist is there to help, right? Um, so it's just life activities that you want to do. Say you are a gardener and you can't garden anymore because you can't lift something anymore. Um, we're just here to, uh, to help you make accommodations so that you can engage in those activities, right? So whether it's providing assistive devices, so say you need like a reacher to get something off a high shelf, um, you enjoy cooking and you can't cook anymore because you can't reach anything. Well, we'll give you the reacher to get off the shelf. Maybe you can't open the can because of the lymphedema or the CIP and you don't have feeling. Well, we'll give you a can opener that's adjusted um, so that you don't have to have extra movements or you don't have to actually feel the can um, to open it. 
So we just provide compensatory strategies. We provide assistive devices and we help you do the things that you want to engage in that give you quality of life and meaning. Mm. You know, um, I actually did have occupational therapy um, because I had mentioned in the um, previous uh, program that we did for this that I am a a breast cancer survivor and actually had a lot of difficulty with my mobility uh, after my surgeries. Um, and then with radiation, I had a lot of difficulty and my breast cancer surgeon actually recommended occupational therapy. And I remember thinking, what is that? You <laughs> know, and like, why is that different? And I have to say all of those little tips and techniques for all of the daily like routines that we do in our homes or when we're going out, like those tips really did help. So it helped prevent, you know, potential further injury, helped with, you know, reducing like swelling, but still like keeping loose, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. So um, I just highly recommend cancer patients and those who have chronic illnesses as well to ask about occupational therapy for those like daily living and it's, assisted devices, uh, because they're really helpful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with me kind of talking a little bit about my own experience with occupational therapy, like when should a person receive occupational therapy or, or what should they be thinking of to be like, hmm, maybe aside from physical therapy, I should have occupational therapy. Yes. Um. So I like to say as soon as cancer treatment starts, right? You should be having that conversation about rehabilitation options, right? You need to fast track it so that you know that you have a plan, right? Once treatment ends, or if you can start therapy in the middle of treatment, right? Um, that is also an option as well. You have to ask your provider what they think, um, what is most suitable for you. Um, but definitely bring that conversation up in the beginning, right? Say, hey, do you think that I would need physical therapy? Do you think I would need occupational therapy? Um, what are the side effects of the treatment that I'm getting? What is the likelihood that I'll get those side effects, right? Like if there is a, a likelihood that they can provide you with. Um, but I think that it's important that once you start experiencing side effects that impact your ability to go about daily life, occupational therapy needs to come into the conversation, right? Um, a lot of times providers will refer to occupational therapy if there's limitation with your arms or upper extremities, right? So if I can't lift my arm because I may have cording, right? So that thick cord that comes up under your arm and it prevents your range of motion, or you may have lymphedema, right? A lot of providers will refer to certified hand therapists. And those are the occupational therapists who specifically deal with upper extremity impairments. Um, but Occupational therapy is so much broader than just certified hand therapists, right? So even though they can help you with the upper extremity injuries, generalists who are OTs can help you with everything else, right? Including the upper extremities. Um, it could just be an addition onto that if you already have it. Um, but yeah, occupational therapists as, should be contacted as soon as daily living activities are inhibited or affected. That's my advice. <laughs> and and I, I totally, you know, support that. And especially like bringing, bringing that up early um, mm -hmm. in, in the discussions with, you know, your medical team um, and then really and truly with your surgeons, if um, you do end up having uh, any type of surgery, because uh, I, I really, I was surprised by how beneficial uh, my own occupational uh, therapist and the tips that um, it was a she, so that she gave me and actually created like a device. Um, I never really thought about it, but I still have it actually that goes um, in my bra for my breast to help with swelling. So uh, it was just, I was impressed. Um, so what are some ways that caregivers or friends or family can help in between say there were uh occupational therapy sessions? What are some things that they can do to help the patient or survivor? Yes, of course. So one of the most important things and one of the ways that OT or any 
therapy can be most effective as if there is a reinforcement at home, right? So the exercises that you may do um, during your therapy treatment, whether that's physical therapy or occupational therapy, if it's like balance exercises or if it's practicing putting your sock, sock on, right? Um, as easy as it may sound, it's difficult, especially when you have side effects that impair you from doing it. Um, just practicing that, right? So I like to have the caregivers involved as much as possible in the therapy treatments so that they can see, okay, this is how you do it. This is how I should do it at home. This is how I should make sure that person is doing it. Um, correct them, right? So just transferring that at home and making sure that we practice whatever we're doing in therapy, um, caregivers are very important in that aspect and encouraging uh, the clients or patients to actually do the activities, right? Because a lot of times it can be like, well, what's the point? Or I'm not, I might not be seeing results as fast as I want to, right? But it takes time. And so reinforcing that actually helps speed up the process <laughs> of the recovery. Um, and then in terms of falling, right? Because that's the topic. Um, caregivers can actually do a lot, uh, especially with practicing with the client or the patient. Um, going over saying, hey, like testing you. Hey, do you remember what's the most important part of the fall? Protect the head, right? Or if you forget all the other steps, what do you do? Meet with me. Um, and the resource that I provided on the slide where it's, if you getting, getting up from a fall safely, um, it actually has a section where it's, okay, I've witnessed a fall or I'm a caregiver, right? How do I help them get up? And it's step-by-step step on how you can help them get up with illustrations as well. Um, but just making sure that you're there supporting them, um, reinforcing what is learned in therapy sessions, encouraging them to practice what is learned in therapy sessions. And yeah, just providing emotional and physical supports, you know, the best options for caregivers. Oh, right. And, and it's so true of, you know, taking from what the, the sessions you know, and keep doing them. Um, that that practice makes perfect uh, adage, you know, so to speak. Um, but th that is so true to just be reminded, like keep doing the exercises. Um, so we know that the side effects from treatments, as you mentioned, um, and surgeries and medications uh, can cause the dizziness and then the falls. So um, when you were talking about the ways to not only fall uh, safely, but then also how to get up safely. I actually learned, I learned some new stuff uh, with that. And I know that was what a lot of the audience really wanted to hear about as well. I, I never uh, thought about, you know, sometimes that standing up or getting up too quickly and how that makes you dizzy and then you end up falling back down. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was a really good reminder. So I was wondering, what are some other tips for like the home? to help limit falling? Of course. Um, so occupational therapists specialize in this as well, right? So prevention tips. So we can go into the home and say, hey, like you need to add this here, add that here. Um, and some examples would be uh, taping down your rug, right? So a lot of people may not realize that it's actually a tripping hazard, right? So the little corners of our rug may flip up um, sometimes. And if we trip over it, it could be you know, pretty painful. Um, so getting some double-sided tape and just taping down the corners of the rug or along all the edges is a simple tip and tool to reduce falling. Um, making sure that we reduce clutter in our home, right? Because a lot of times we just put things places and we may not put them in the safest places, right? So reducing clutter, getting boxes out of hallways, getting like low coffee tables out of, I don't know, just the middle of the room, you know, um, just keeping things in the, the, keeping a clear path is what I meant to say, sorry. Um, getting rid of cords and wires unnecessarily on the floor, right? So maybe we put them behind the furniture or maybe we get like those, you ever seen those like cord hiders? Uh, yes, that they yes. Yeah. So putting the cords in that, right? To reduce it, reduce, you know, just them being out. Um, making sure that we're in well-lit areas. I know that sometimes it's not really thought about, but lighting can affect our ability to, of course, see, right? We may not be able to see where we're going and we may trip. Um, so making sure that there's well-lit areas, making sure that when we are going up the stairs, we're holding on to the railing, um, going up and going down. If we have those 
carpet things on our stairs, right? Making sure they're tight and secured. Like if they're loose, that can cause us to trip. Um, yeah, that's, that's like some of the few ideas. Some, yeah, those are some great tips. And uh, as someone who uh, recently moved <laughs> and I have hardwood floors and I did get like some uh, carpet accents. And honestly, I, I have tripped because I did not think about uh, actually putting something underneath to make sure it's gripped and stays in place. So I feel like it's lots of really small things that you're not necessarily always thinking about that mm -hmm. can actually like literally trip you up. Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much uh, for those tips. And then can you just go a little bit more in, into details on the ways to get it from a fall safely? Like, you know, when you mentioned making sure it's like the dominant side that you get at that might be like the stronger side and trying to get to a piece of furniture or something that can like hold your weight like what happens if it's like the lower extremity that you're having a difficulty with are there certain other ways to really use the upper extremity to help you get back up mm -hmm. so what i would say is if you are having difficulty with the lower extremity um you want to put as much weight as you can on the upper extremity. Um, so if we're getting in that position where we're on our side and we need to crawl to a piece of furniture, right? And we may not have uh, a lot of feeling in our lower extremities, or we may have a lot of swelling due to lymphedema, um, use your arms, right? Like we're going to crawl, yes, as much weight as we can, but we want to make sure that we're safe in doing so because we may not be able to feel those injuries if we do get injured while crawling. We're going to use our upper extremity. We're going to put as much as much weight on the areas that we can feel as possible. Um, but I always say, like, go with your dominant side. When you are on, when you're by the furniture and you're lifting yourself up, you can put as much weight as you need to in those arms. Um, but if it gets painful, right? We're going to adapt and we're going to put the weight on our foot. We have to trust um, that we can do it. Like we have to be confident in the fact that we can do it, right? Because when we lack that confidence, it's kind of like, well, I don't know. And then we make it unsteady, right? Um, but can I show the actual, one of the links that I have? Um, Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen because I feel like it's a very visual way for us to okay Let's see it oh, oh wow yeah so this is Ooh, it's too big <laughs> um so this is actually how we can get up right so if you it goes if you can get up if you cannot get up and if you are a witness right so for caregivers or that support system so if we're having difficulty with our lower extremity right and we're trying to get into step two where we're crawling maybe using our arms to propel ourselves forward, right? Um, and that all comes into strengthening, right? Strengthening our arms during those therapy sessions. Um, and then you see here in step three, when she's putting her dominant leg or the stronger leg forward to get up, right? We have to, we have to make sure that we're like, okay, this is the stronger leg. Even though I may not be able to feel in both legs, right? this is the leg that I stand on the most, right? Because you know, when you stand, sometimes you lean to one side more than the other. Maybe we should go for that side, right? If we know that, okay, this is the side that I may feel strongest on. Um, and then standing up, we're putting all that force through our arms, right? So we can minimize the amount of force we put through our legs. Um, and then of course, this is the, if you cannot get up, what you should do, um, if you can reach for the phone and make the emergency call. And this is one thing I would like to add in terms of home modifications. If you have tables that are lower, right? So if your telephone is kind of low to the ground, it'll be easier for you to get to, right? So instead of placing that phone on higher countertops, maybe we should place them on like the bedside table or the couch side little mini table so that we can reach it in the event that we do fall, right? Especially if we know that we're at risk for falling. Um, and then this is specifically the caregiver section where the caregiver can help you. If there's someone there with you, it doesn't even have to be a caregiver if it's a stranger. Um, if you know these steps too, you can actually guide them in how to get you up, right? Like, hey, okay, I need you to be behind me so that you can brace me or protect my back or like help guide me into the standing position. Um, but yeah, so in short, what I was responding to you about is you can 
compensate by using stronger extremities, right? So if my legs, I can't feel them or if they're swelling, use your arms, right? And if same with your arms, if they're swelling, you can't feel them, use your legs, right? And if we have both, we have to just kind of trust ourselves, right? And we have to do what we have to do to kind of get up where it's like, all right, like I'm just going to put the force through it. And then when I sit down, I'm going to check for injuries, see if anything got has gotten worse or I've increased swelling. And then I'll call my provider or therapist from there. Well, jean Vier, we thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this, uh, go through your presentation again, so everyone can really like focus on the excellent uh, tips that you have given us today. And we will um, attach that uh, diagram of how to get up from a fall safely um, when we send out the recording of this presentation along with the uh, original one. So again, thank you so much, jean Vier, And everyone, don't forget, uh, go to sharecancersupport.org to look up upcoming programs, support groups, podcasts, and additional resources. Thank you, jean Vier. You're welcome. <laughs>